Yes, I mess and now I'm messing up because we're not live. <laughs> Hi, and thank you for joining us today on Eye Openers. Today I have Dr. Sheeta Shafi. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Of course. So today, you know how I always start off, which is what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking my favorite beverage, which is Dunkin' Donuts hot black coffee. And I'm so excited that you are repping Dunkin' Donuts today because it's not, you know, not a typical thing necessarily on the show, but it is central to your success. It's fueling you, right? And uh, so uh, the other day, this is a, this is like a fun story, an insider story, um, because Dr. Shafi and I are neighbors and we got a call and it was like, was it Christmas Eve or the, yeah. um, Yeah, Christmas Eve day. And we don't usually get a call from your household and it said, you know, can you help us out? And what was the emergency? <laughs> Our car battery had died and I was in the middle of the road and I had a very important place to stop by. <laughs> a Dunkin' Donuts run. Yeah. So uh, I love that. I love that story. Um, and tell me, what do you love about Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, the consistency. And it's just always around. And it's just like my little routine. I get it every morning. I love my hot black Duncan, extra large. And then I like microwave it all day long too. <laughs> my husband does that too. I'm like, is that still good? I don't know. But maybe it's a, it's an ER doctor thing. I don't know. <laughs> so I want to give you a proper introduction to do you justice. Um, so Dr. Shafi is an ER physician who is also an assistant professor at Brown University's Warren Alpert Medical School. So she serves as the director of International Ultrasound Fellowship for Brown, the, um, the residency program, and serves on the board of Rhode Island Economic Progress Institute and the, the Providence Preservation Society. Oh, that's a mouthful. Do you want to give us like uh, three bullets on each of those and the work you're doing there and why it's important to you? Sure. Uh, I have a faculty appointment at the residency um, through Brown EM, and then I teach the global fellows who come over from Saudi Arabia and are trying to learn point of care ultrasound to kind of revolutionize point of care ultrasound care internationally. And then uh, EPI, the Economic Progress Institute is my like favorite organization. I love working for them and working on influencing policy for Rhode Islanders who are most in need. And then Preservation Society is just like such a beautiful way of preserving our incredibly gorgeous city. So love the work I do. <laughs> awesome. Um, what I love about you is you're so well-rounded. Like you're not just a doctor, you think about our community from all these different perspectives and are showing up as a leader in those different ways too. And it's not just these organizations, right? But you also um, are, have twins and you are devoted to mentoring and coaching colleagues and trainees to help them find ways to advance their careers and invest in their own personal development. And how are you doing that? So actually, um, I am launching my own business as a performance coach. Um, uh, I've had a few clients already and it's been really like um, something that's just brought me so much happiness. I love that work. Um, I've done it for a long time um, with uh, people that I've worked with in residence and junior faculty and some of my friends, but now I'm kind of taking it to a professional level. Awesome. And what's your number one mission in that? Um, helping people kind of find their joy and realizing that having joy is actually what fuels them to be able to do all this work. You know, I, like you said, I do have a lot of roles that I play, but, um, but they all give me their joy. They're not just like tasks to be done or like steps to be climbing, but rather like making my heart explode kind of situation. Awesome. Um, So it was really important to me to have you on today because we talk about leadership here. We talk about breakthroughs and really through the concept of eye openers, right? Like something that changes the way you see your business, your life, um, and therefore your trajectory. And one thing that's really uh, something you have a unique perspective on is the pandemic that we're in right now. You, know, you have been tasked with running the field hospital here in Rhode Island. It's a huge responsibility, but you also have this really compassionate side of you that um, wants to support your colleagues, wants to help even um, patients see um, a different way of experiencing their life. Now, I want to. I would love to hear about um, 
through, through this pandemic, what has been something that has brought you joy through this or how have you helped other people maintain resilience and see joy um, in this dark time? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic was hard for sure. Um, I think one of the things is I got really prepared and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, very early on in March, we realized that like this was gonna be going on for a long time. Um, and in the beginning, we didn't know what the transmission was like exactly. So I like set up a lot of systems. Um, I love systems. I think systems are a really great way to take away a lot of the cognitive burden of living, especially in a time like this when we have to make millions of decisions. So one thing I did was set up a lot of systems for our, our household to make it safe. And one of those things was I set up a room for me to kind of like decon in and be in by myself away from family. And I stocked that room filled with poetry. Like a lot of the Persian um, mystic poets, I really love them like Hafez and Rumi. So I like found a place to ground myself so I could like be happy and find a little bit of joy and like solace in that. And then through that, so like once I kind of taken care of myself, then I actually um, became a big kind of leader of doing a lot of social activities on Zoom for the early part of the pandemic. Um, so when people our, were still excited about those like cocktail hours and stuff on Zoom. Yeah, and it was fun. And they were all different. Like, so, you know, we have a group of 125 doctors. And so, you know, they all have different kinds of, uh, they have different, that's just the attending positions. And then we also have the residents, which is about 64 or 65 of them. And then the APPs, which are the PAs and NPs. So everyone's in different places of life. So all those were varied and different. And uh, actually like, it was awesome. They honored me at the end of this year with an award, which was really awesome for promoting wellness. And then in places where you can make little changes, I really try to find those places and like capitalize on those. So. Actually, in the field hospital, my amazing school that my kids go to, I reached out from them and said, listen, these, this is like a kind of sterile place. It's the convention center, right? Like they've just put up walls and made mm -hmm. things. And so I said, is there, I was thinking maybe we could put up some art that the students made. And I talked to, you know, we had to get it cleared by the fire marshal and all that stuff. And I only said, yeah, as long as it's something um, that's laminated. And so we did the standard, we called it the project, the windows of healing. And they actually just went up uh, a few days ago, but they laminate all these beautiful pictures made from, you know, kids from preschool all the way to eighth grade. And, you know, just like bringing little bits of joy actually has a huge toll um, and bring that wellness to the patient. So like, you know, that kind of stuff I love doing. And you think it takes work to do those things and it does, but it, it creates joy. And I think that's the big difference. Like not all work is created equal. Like some of the work expands your heart and expands like the frustrations of living during the pandemic, you know? Mm -hmm. So even though during this time you have so much on your plate, you're finding these little ways where technically this is work, but it actually fills you back up and it adds to your resilience. Her, totally. Okay. And how have you been able as a leader in your team and your organization, how have you been able to try to implement that for others or organizationally? Um, yeah, that, you know, it's hard because everyone is suffering right now, like, especially in the healthcare field. I think a lot of people are really down. So giving opportunities that are varied for them to do something fun and take care of themselves has been good. And like so many of my colleagues have also worked on that and supporting them when they are making opportunities like that. Um, you know, one of our colleagues had like a night worth of trivia and had cocktails delivered to people's homes, which was like so sweet. And so making sure you take the time to invest in efforts from other people has been big. And then when you show up at work, I really do try to bring my best self and let go of everything else and bring my energy to where I am, not like the lingering things that are going on back at home or outside of the direct immediate place. Because there's not much I can do about those things in the emergency room, I have to take care of the people that are in front of me and the team that's in front of me. Um, so learning really how to let go of those other attachments has been integral to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really speaks to um, the science of presence, right? And, and happiness and that the better we get at just keeping our um, heads in the same place that our feet are in, really adds to people's experience of happiness, but it's really difficult to do. And in my experience of working with um, leadership, that becomes more challenging the further up um, you are on that ladder and uh, you're responsible for so many things, yet you're trying to stay with 
what's right in front of you. And so some people really experience that as an incredibly heavy burden. Um, but I found that it's, it's like a muscle that the more you exercise it, the more you flex it, like the stronger it gets and the better you get at creating that kind of differentiation. Um, I'm sure you've, I know you're a fan of atomic habits and, um, books like that. Have you found little tips or tactics that have been useful for you? Yeah. I mean, I live and die by my calendar. Like, uh, I use the 15 minute, like I was just reading a quote actually from the atomic habits newsletter, which I just signed up for, for through a friend. Um, I, I had not had that before, but, um, the finder of Ikea, not like, yeah, Ikea talks about using 10 minute blocks. I use 15 minute blocks. My life is scheduled in 15 minute blocks. And, it, and, you know, to some people that seems like so crazy to schedule everything, but I also schedule a lot of free time where I don't do anything. Um, but when I know that I have a lot of time for like something that I have to do, um, like even if it's like wrapping Christmas presents, if I know that I have the time to do it, I'm not, it's not a task that's taking up like CPU storage in the back of my mind because it has a need to do that, right? Like I already know, okay, I've set a time to do this. Or, you know, I give a lot of lectures and like creating lectures is hard because you have to really like kind of go inside yourself and figure out what you're going to talk and what you're going to present. And so making sure I have time to do that so that I'm not thinking about it while I'm trying to like listen to a presentation from a resident. Yeah, exactly. I find that the best technique, like it's such an easy tool and so effective. Yeah, and I know so many people are making lists, but it's actually finding those pockets of time, right? To implement is what makes all the difference there in creating your success, finding that yeah. time really on your calendar. And what things you do when too, like, especially like, I mean, I know that, um, Ramey, your husband is like a yard ER doctor. So, you know, the schedule of like some nights you get home at three in the morning. So like that next day at 8 a.m. is probably not gonna be the time where you can like write a paper or for me, that kind of work requires a lot more like brain power usage, but that's a great time to wrap presents, something that's mindless, but like easy to do. And what we, I think what we tend to do is that we keep delaying those things that take our brain a lot more work to do. So if I know that the only morning that I'm going to have where I'm going to have been well rested and don't have kids. And I make sure I block that time to do the things that the deep work. Um, right. right. Uh, then I am more successful with that, but we tend to do the checklist work first because it's fun to take them off that list. Totally. Totally. The snowball effect, which can be helpful for different things. Um, so what would you say um, was the most valuable thing you learned from a previous mentor or boss? So I would have to say one of my favorite bosses of all time is my boss in uh, Brooklyn, John Marshall, who uh, is the chair of the emergency department there, uh, which is like a, it, which is the biggest hospital in Brooklyn. Uh, it's called Maimonides and it's in the outer boroughs. So it's not um, in a very well-resourced neighborhood. Um, and from him, I learned that like, you don't have to know the steps exactly to take to move forward with a project and how it's going to come. You don't need to know every single thing to make a project happen. Um, you just have to have the drive and the want and, and you can push forward. And the project that I specifically am referring to when I see this is that um, that part of Brooklyn uh, did not have a level one trauma center. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, that part of Brooklyn has, I think, 6 million people living in that area alone. It's like, it's huge. It's a huge population, lots of kids. It's a very Hasidic neighborhood. They have big families. Um, also a lot of immigrants who also have big families and the, there's no trauma center. So kids who got like, you know, kids get hit by cars in Brooklyn, not that on often because there's a lot of traffic and kids are on scooters. And like when they would get hit by a car, they would maybe come to my mind for a little bit, but then once stabilized, they'd be shipped over to Long Island, which is like an hour and a half drive and decent traffic. And these like poor families would have to make the trip there. And like, they're not necessarily well-resourced families either. And there's just so many complications. And so he really felt like it was important that a population that big had a level one trauma center mm -hmm. that served children specifically. And so, you know, he made that happen in a hospital that's busy, under-resourced in every way. You know, when I work at Brown, like I always feel so spoiled because, you know, they have like two CAT scanners and they have like had one little tiny CAT scanner and like a double the population hospital. So like to see that being made out of out of nothing really, not out of nothing, but out of very uh, bare bones. And like it, over the course of the time that I was there, like it happened and it's successful and it keep going and providing a service that's really integral to the community. Beautiful. So that really reinforced for you that like 
if there's a will, there can be a way yeah. and um, to push for what you know is important yeah. for a cause beyond yourself. That's beautiful. Um, so what, what were maybe some early mistakes you made as a leader that now you know better? Yeah, there are a lot of those. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I uh, have learned over the course of time is that everyone has a role to play and boundaries are your own role to make. You know, I was a, I had transitioned from being a resident really quickly into an, a high level administrative position at Maimonides. And, you know, when someone would text me at 11 o'clock at night, I was like, oh my God, I got to react to this. Even though it might've been like, hey, you know, I would like to go on vacation in three months from now. Can I do that? I would feel like, okay, I got to react because they're asking something of me and I have to always be open and available. And and then you get frustrated at the other person for not knowing boundaries of like, oh, texting is only for emergencies. Calling is for emergencies. Email is for non-urgent requests. But the truth is like you get to set the terms in your own boundaries. And that um, that applies to a lot of other things. You have zero control over how other people behave. You only really have control over yourself, which is something I always knew. But I think applying that to the work was really important for me to learn that um you don't ha always have to respond to every single thing right away. And it's okay to delay that. Mm, yeah. So behavior change is hard, right? Like it's hard in ourselves and it's even more difficult when we're trying to do it with a team or, you know, something outside of ourselves. So what's something that you've implemented anywhere that you've worked um, or even at your house that has been successful in promoting a positive behavior change? Yeah. So, uh, definitely at, I, you know, I, in my admin position at work, I did a ton of that kind of work, um, where a lot of it was setting up rules and systems. Um, and I feel like rules and systems are my jam. I love operationalizing anything that can be operationalized. I think it takes a lot of burden away from the team um, that's doing it. So if, you know, and, and, and we do this in medicine all the time, right? Like, uh, in, we it, like people have done it. Uh, like when you think I work in a level one trauma center, we see patients come in with all kinds of things going on. Um, and you know, so you can see this might be a little graphic for your audience, but it's like you see like a dangling ankle off of if you like a patient comes in, they had a really bad fall, fall they have an open fracture, and their ankle ankle is dangling off. You can't focus on the ankle. Like the ankle is not like, and we always go A B C D which is airway, make sure they have an airway. Like, do they also hit their head? Are they concussed? What else is going on? Breathing, circulation. And then we get to the ankle. The ankle probably doesn't need much for, the ankle can wait five minutes. And like- To you, this might be shocking. <laughs> <laughs> because, the, because the thing is you have to prioritize what the priority is. And like, if someone's not breathing, that is the priority. And so that is something we get really good at as ER doctors, but we get good at it and then we operationalize it. So we do it for these important patient care stuff, but we can do it for our workflow too. And we can also do it for like how we schedule our patient, our, our staff. So that, those kinds of things really helped. Um, but it is a lot of rule setting. Like this is your request for me to be in by this day. This is how we're going to make this even whatnot. So that kind of stuff. And I do think it really elevated the mood. Because they now had systems that were predictable, dependable, and they, the expectations were now aligned. Yeah, exactly. Like people knew what is expected of them. And like my kids are also subject to a control for mom <laughs> a little bit in terms of operations. Like, you know, we always have our meals pretty much at the same time. Like, uh, you know, and I'll, I think you know this, but like they have these little boxes on their nightstands where we put their clothes for the next day because in the morning when it's time to get out to get ready to school, we don't need to be negotiating what anyone's wearing. Like they have weather appropriate clothes. That is what they wear to school. On the weekends, do whatever you want. But like when we're trying to get out the door for school, we don't need to have any extra barriers. Mm -hmm. So we do little things like that and they know and it works pretty well. Awesome. I love that. Um, tell me about a pivotal insight or breakthrough that changed the way you lead. Hmm. I think the main thing we kind of touched on it before is about energy. I think energy being, so this, there's this concept of your physical energy and your physical body and your energy body. And they're two different things. And if they're not together, you cannot lead from a very good place, I think. Um, and that energy can also be created. Uh, and that those are kind of, and what I mean by that is, you know, 
like you can change your energy, right? Like I might be going into a shift. I'm actually going to a shift tonight. And, you know, let's say like we had this horrible conversation today and it was horrible and I felt sad after it. I actually have a choice to go make myself happier. I could like jump on my Peloton for 15 minutes and dance to Whitney Houston. Like you can change your energy. You are able to change your energy or you can keep your energy stagnant with where, where a circumstance may have led you. And you can analyze that and you can kind of break that down. Mm -hmm. getting your energy to a place where you want it to be at work and where you want it to be in leadership and making sure your physical body and your physical energy and your energy body are in the same place. Mm. That's like a really big thing that I work on and I teach a lot. I love that because that can bring people back. Like if you're having a tough moment or a bad day or a bad week, you can come back to that idea and that concept and ask yourself if you're having that alignment or where you're out of alignment, right? Yeah. And maybe having like a set of tools or resources that really work for you to bring you back. Yeah. And like, you know, my husband has a desk job and he's kind of learned through this process of like, if you're really having like a hard time just focusing on like taking a 15 minute walk changes like totally changes your energy and you're back to doing the work and a lot of times we think we're wasting time when we do these like 15 minute relaxations or five minute relaxation by going for a walk or whatever and, and what do we and a lot of times like we'll like have a cookie or something like that and that doesn't bring your energy up you just fall after like five minutes you know so but you can change your energy and that's so important um to do and also the work you do changes energy i mean like a lot of the reason i got involved with epi is because you know, working in the emergency room. Economic is- Progress Institute. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. A lot um, of acronyms today. I'm trying to break it down. <laughs> <laughs> One of the challenges is like you go to the emergency room and like we have a limit of the scope of what we can provide to our patients. But a lot of these patients, like they're like one of the patients that really like, like pushed me into like joining the board was that um, like she came in and she said, oh, my legs are really swollen. Both of them are swollen. She was a young woman, like early 20s. I said, okay, like, what are you eating? What are you drinking? Like, why would this woman, like a 20 year old doesn't have heart failure. It doesn't sound like she has blood clots, both sides. And she told me that she had just recently become homeless. Like she had a full-time job working 50 hours a week, but didn't have enough money to like live somewhere on her own because like their, their, the livable wage situation in Rhode Island is really not very good. And like, I can't really do anything about that from the emergency room. But when I'm working through EPI or Rhode Island Economic Progress Institute, we like work on policy. I like fundraise for them and try to help policies to help these people. And so that work gives me energy and that like, I don't have to just sit there and bear witness to all the suffering of people who are, you know, they, they just are suffering because the world is aligned sort of against them. I can work towards that in another arena and not feel as hopeless in the emergency room. Mm. I love that. So you're looking at the problem from a different lens, from a different perspective and trying to create solutions outside of like the immediate solution someone might need, but that's in some ways, uh, no pun intended, just a bandaid on a bigger problem. Um, And that maybe it's for those of us who have the ability that it's also our responsibility to move into trying to find solutions that actually um, prevent um, some of these issues than just put a bandaid on it. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what's the um, greatest opportunity or challenge that you have in front of you in 2021? Well, there's a pandemic. <laughs> there's that. Well, I'm sure there's more. No, more. Let's, let's, let's talk about that for a second though, because, you know, people are tuning in to hear about what a leader in the ER is, you know, how you're managing this and what you see as, um, as the biggest kind of challenge there beyond the actual medicine, beyond the limited, you know, uh, resources. And um, yeah, I mean, I think our biggest challenge is going to be getting the vaccine out um, in an appropriate way. Um, I think we're done a pretty good job of outlining which uh, categories people fit into, but you know, we want people to get vaccinated. I think that's going to be super important. Um, so that is definitely a big challenge um, and getting people to realize that it's, you know, there's so much, um, mistrust there. Um, and, and it's hard, you know, it's hard to get people to remember that this is an important initiative. So that's obviously something that's very big, um, that's in front of all of us. Um, and we're doing advocacy to do that and educate people about the safety of the vaccine. We're getting it and showing them like, look, we're fine. Um, don't be afraid. So that's a huge, huge burden, obviously. And then kind of on a more personal life, like, you know, I'm, I'm, doing a lot of work, uh, launching my business. And that's a challenge. It's a, 
it's hard to put yourself out there. Um, it's hard to do, uh, take on something where you're, um, creating something new when you already have like a pretty successful trajectory that you like, you know, I don't, there's no necessity. So the, the necessity is only from like my inner heart of like, I need to share this information with the world. And I, um, don't want to see more of my colleagues and professionals suffering, um, because they don't need to, um, they can, you know, they're, they're really accomplished people and like getting that accomplishment translate to other parts of their life where they're dragging. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's challenging and new and it's always hard to be new at something. Um, mm. so for me, that's a big challenge I have for me. Mm. I, I bet that this is going to come as a surprise to some people because when people hear about your accomplishments or what you're involved in, I think people just think, oh, she's got it all figured out or like she's got confidence like coming through the roof. But when I hear you talk about this, it's like, you know, anytime we're in a new situation, I think most of us can appreciate this, that that there is um, some space for you to get nervous about it. There, there's, there's a place where you think you might fail at something and then what will happen, right? And so as... Um, as someone who has like a lot of success in one area of your life and now stepping into this new role, how do you try to take, um, take some of that um, confidence and that success energy and how do you translate it over to times when you're not? I remember is that I didn't have that confidence and energy when I first started this. And I, and like, I think that is something that's really important to remember. Like I didn't come out of the womb, like as a level one trauma ER, like yes, I work critical care and like running around, like, I didn't know how to command a room like that, um, coming out of the womb. And I certainly didn't know it even, uh, in my first and second year of medical school or third or fourth year, it took many years to develop that. Um, and the way it, it developed is like, I graduated little bits of it and I just kept doing, working at it. And then now I do feel like I have a really good command of a room, um, uh, uh, like a trauma room. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think about that every time, like, you know, I've been doing all these Instagram videos and stories, like sharing bits of myself and, um, and you know, they're not all great. Like there's some are not perfect, but you know, I do my best. And like, sometimes I cut off in the wrong spot or, <laughs> and I just realized I just have to keep putting myself out there and keep doing it. Um, cause that's the only way you grow. Um, but I think that gets harder as we get older. We're just so like, if you have a successful path, it's like, well, why even try this new thing? Like we become so set in our ways. Um, but I think that's the, like one of the biggest skills you can work on in life is flexibility, being flexible and changing and adapting. Um, so I remind myself of that too, that that is a value for me, like being flexible and learning new things. Awesome. So it's like things that are really hard, like TikTok. <laughs> I, did, we did our first, I did my first TikTok video with a friend the other day. And like, they, they just, I just posted it on my Instagram. I was like, I'm finally a TikTok dog. Awesome. So where can people find your first TikTok video? You said you put it on your uh, Instagram and you said yeah. you have an Instagram stories too. So tell us how we can find you and follow. So just YouTube. my name at Sheeta Shaffing, which is obviously not so easy to spell, but it's right in that little corner there. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm not even good at pointing on these things. <laughs> Perfect. And that's the best place to like hear about what you're up to, like where you share tips, yeah, um, what you're learning about. Okay. And how you're helping people. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really love hearing about your experience. I'm certain that other people have too. And I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing and um, helping out our community. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. It was so fun.